You're listening to the free ad-sponsored re-release of American Elections Wicked Game, a weekly march through every presidential election from 1789 to 2024. To listen to all episodes right now ad-free, go to intohistory.com. Subscribers there enjoy ad-free listening, early access, bonus content, and more from a growing collection of great history podcasts. Start your free trial today at intohistory.com. It's July 1st, 1893, on New York City's East River. President Grover Cleveland stands on the deck of his friend's yacht, the Oneida, savoring a cigar. Yesterday morning, Cleveland asked Congress to call a special session. Then he sailed from Washington in secret. The official story is that he's on a four-day fishing trip to Cape Cod and will return when Congress convenes. Only those on board know the trip's true purpose. The president takes another slow drag and exhales, trying his best to prepare for what comes next. Mr. President, we're almost ready to begin. In a moment, Dr. Keene. May I trouble you for company? Oh, it's no trouble, sir. Cleveland's second term just began, and already he faces a sea of troubles. The Panic of 1893 is the worst economic situation the country has ever seen. He's inherited an economic mess, and he intends to clean it up. After a moment of silence, Cleveland speaks. I hope posterity will not judge me for what we do here today. Mr. President, you are all that stands between this country and absolute disaster. Your death would be a great calamity to this country. I detest all this secrecy, but I understand it. I hope they will understand. I do not do this out of vanity. The country is in the midst of economic ruin. The Sherman Silver Purchase Act, passed under Republican President Harrison, requires the government to buy silver at an overvalued rate. This disastrous legislation has created a run on gold. Reserves are depleted, banks are failing, and people's savings have disappeared. To stop the bleeding of gold, Cleveland needs the law immediately repealed. But one thing stands in the president's way. He has just been diagnosed with cancer. Doctor, do you truly feel that this must be done now? This disease is a bad-looking tenant. I would have it evicted immediately. Several weeks ago, President Cleveland noticed a rough place on the roof of his mouth where he holds his cigar. Once examined, his doctors found a quarter-sized ulcer on his gums. The testing of a small bone fragment confirmed it was malignant. If the dreaded news of the president's condition were added to the national calamity, it might sink the country entirely. So to save the economy, Cleveland's fishing party, five doctors and a dentist, must save the president. They must do it all in secret. Oh, Doctor, I don't know if I will survive this. We will do our best, Mr. President. Oh, no, I, I have every faith in your abilities, Doctor. I mean the office of the presidency. Sir, if your first term was any measure, you will persevere and the country will be all the better for it. Yes, but, you know, in calm water, every ship has a good captain. Cleveland takes one last drag from his cigar and tosses it overboard. All right, I'm ready, Doctor. I trust you can operate on a moving ship? It might also be said that in calm water, every ship has a good doctor. But yes, if the captain holds us steady, I can take care of the rest. For the procedure, President Cleveland sat in a chair bound to the mast. Because of his age and physical condition, he was only given mild anesthesia. Several molars were removed, as well as the entire left upper jaw. To protect the president's signature mustache, the hour-and-a-half operation was performed inside the mouth without any external incisions. Then he was fitted with a rubber prosthesis to replace the missing section of jaw and palate. When Grover Cleveland addressed the special session of Congress on August 7th, no one was the wiser. He won his repeal of the Silver Purchase Act, and the public would not learn about the surgery until 1917. It was one of the best-kept political secrets in American history, but the repeal of the Silver Act had massive consequences. For Washington, it set off a fiery debate in both parties that would define the election of 1896. For Cleveland, the repeal would amount to political suicide. Wicked Game is sponsored by Factor. You know that nursery rhyme, peas porridge hot, peas porridge cold, peas porridge in the pot, nine days old? Well, the first thing you need to know is that peas porridge was a real thing. 
Second, it's spelled P-E-A-S-E, a a Middle English plural noun like flower, but made from legumes like peas. Third, it was the ultimate in medieval convenience food. Boil up anything you had in a single pot until you get a viscous slime, eat what you can stand, then just keep eating. Hot or cold, throwing in more stuff as you go. Nine days old may not be an exaggeration. So convenient, but not tasty, and maybe even rancid. These days, we are so much better off with Factor. Same convenience, much more taste, and a lot less gross. Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit. Chef-prepared, dietitian-approved, ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door with over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie-smart, vegan, veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious and certainly better than throwing whatever you can scrounge into a pot. Head to factormeals.com slash wickedgame50 and use code wickedgame50 to get 50% off. That's code wickedgame50 at factormeals.com slash wickedgame50 to get 50% off. Wicked Game is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you do if you had an extra hour in your day? It could come at any time in the morning, midday, in the evening. You could sleep in. You could actually take a lunch. You could go on an evening walk. I'd like to say I'd take a nap or read a book, but knowing me, I'd probably end up working because there's always work to do, right? A lot of us wish we had more time, but time for what? Do you know what's important to you? How to make it a priority? Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. And as the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. And if things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com elections today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash elections. From Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Elections Wicked Game. In the election of 1888, Grover Cleveland lost his bid for re-election to Republican Benjamin Harrison. As he and the First Lady moved from the White House, Francis Cleveland made a prediction, telling a steward, we are coming back just four years from today. She was right. Grover Cleveland won the election of 1892 and became the first and only president to begin a non-consecutive second term. But the nation had changed by the time the Clevelands re-entered the White House. Events during the previous four years of Harrison's presidency had turned the economic surplus Cleveland enjoyed into a massive depression. At the beginning of Cleveland's second term, companies were bankrupt, banks were insolvent, and unemployment was skyrocketing. The Panic of 1893 was caused by a web of international and domestic economic conditions, from the price of wheat in Argentina to the failure of the Philadelphia and Reading Railway. And it hit Americans hard. One in five of them were without work. Cleveland inherited a mess and was vocal in placing the blame on Harrison and the Republicans. But throughout his second term, while Cleveland sought to save the economy, he turned to policies many Republicans embraced, leaving the labor movement and many in his own Democratic Party feeling betrayed. For Grover Cleveland, his second term would be his last. The election of 1896 would become a realignment of the two major political parties. It would be a contest between the little guy and big business, between the haves and have-nots, and between silver and gold. The two men carrying the torch of their political parties were Republican William McKinley and Democrat William Jennings Bryan. This is episode 28, 1896, Bryan versus McKinley, the Battle of the Standard Bearers. Grover Cleveland was inaugurated on March 4th, 1893, but already signs of financial trouble were evident. Twelve days prior, on February 20th, the Philadelphia and Reading Railway Company had failed. Railroads were a massive industry, their sprawling tracks and thousands of cars making up a significant portion of demand for steel and labor. But they were overbuilt and overextended, 
financed largely with corporate debt. With the collapse of the Philadelphia and Reading Railway, many feared the banks backing them would fail too. This fear drove investors in the U.S. and abroad to liquidate their investments in American stocks, bonds, and other securities, redeeming the proceeds in gold. But gold was already in short supply because of silver. Republican President Benjamin Harrison had signed the Sherman Silver Purchase Act into law on July 14, 1890, passed in tandem with the McKinley Tariff. Both these acts were compromise measures, responding to competing concerns from industry and farmers and laborers. The first of the two, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, was a response to farmers and others struggling with debt who wanted free silver, the unlimited coinage of silver. Silver as a currency would, one, drive up the price of crops through inflation, and two, drive down the value of their debt. And though the Sherman Act didn't completely enact a free silver policy, it did require the federal government to increase its purchase of silver by millions of ounces a month. The Treasury would buy the silver with special paper Treasury notes, but the notes could be redeemed for either silver or gold at a government-mandated exchange rate. But the government rate was not the market rate. Silver was overvalued by the act, and as a result, investors bought silver from the markets and mining companies, sold it to the U.S. government for notes, exchanged the notes for gold from the Treasury, used some of the gold to buy more silver, and then did it all over again. This investment maneuver is known as arbitrage, and it's basically free money for the investor, but disaster for the Treasury. So when the failure of the Philadelphia and Reading Railway Company produced a run on gold, the nation discovered it was running out. But despite this unintended consequence, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act was popular among many of President Cleveland's Democratic supporters. What was not popular was the other act passed at the same time, the McKinley Tariff Act of 1890. This act, pushed by protectionist Republicans, tried to promote American goods by restricting foreign imports, putting a staggering 48% tax on some imported goods. But many of these goods were needed by farmers and laborers, many of which were Democrats. The unpopularity of this tariff had almost single-handedly cost Republicans the election of 1892. So when President Cleveland returned for his non-consecutive second term, most expected him to fulfill his campaign promise and eliminate the tariff. The Democrats had won the presidency and both houses of Congress. There was a clear mandate for the tariff's immediate repeal. But Cleveland was also a believer in the gold standard. And with financial conditions worsening, he turned his attention to repealing the Sherman Silver Purchase Act instead. Fighting through his secret cancer surgery, he had the act repealed. But it was far too late to save the economy. The damage had been done. And Cleveland's attempt to cure the country's economic problems had only created political ones. In the eyes of many Democrats, Cleveland had betrayed his party and turned his back on the farmers and laborers that supported him. In the summer of 1894, he would double down. It's July 3rd, 1894, and tensions are high in Chicago, Illinois. Eugene Debs, president of the American Rail Union, paces the wooden floor of his hotel room. A week ago, he ordered his union to strike. Now, the Pullman boycott, Debs' principal stand against the Pullman Palace Car Company, has grown into a national movement. Rail lines across the country are at a standstill. Debs is in way over his head. George Howard, his vice president, bursts into the room a copy of the Chicago Tribune in hand. Frustrated, Howard reads the headlines out loud to Debs. Mobs in control. Law is trampled on. Through the lawless act of dictator Debs, that's you, the lives of thousands of Chicago citizens were endangered yesterday. <sighs> this is exactly what I warned you would happen, Mr. Debs. Don't blame me. Blame George Pullman. We tried to handle this matter without striking. We gave two requests to negotiate. He wouldn't even speak to us. Just two years ago, George M. Pullman's business was booming. His Pullman luxury dining and sleeping cars were a symbol of prosperity. He paid his employees well and provided them with affordable housing. Then came the Panic of 1893. He cut wages by 25%, but refused to lower his employees' rent. Eugene Debs and the American Rail Union stepped in to help the workers press for better wages, but Pullman refused to negotiate. We drew a line in the sand, Mr. Howard. When Pullman ignored us, we had no choice but to strike. But now things have gotten completely out of hand. I warned you to keep this local, only Pullman employees. The workers living in Pullman's town are starving. An injury to one in the cause of labor is the concern of all. Labor ought to unite and stand by labor. And they are uniting. 
Nearly 125,000 workers across the country have joined the ARU by boycotting Pullman cars. Switchmen are removing Pullman cars from trains. Railroad companies have stopped running trains for fear of breaking contract with Pullman. As many as 20 rail lines are at a complete standstill. Call off the strike immediately, Mr. Debs. If I do, thousands of men will lose their jobs. The railroads have already pledged to fire any strikers. Damn it, you fool. Listen to me. Judge Woods just issued an injunction against us. An injunction? On what, on what grounds? Interference with the Postal Service. That's federal. I made my instructions to the union clear. Avoid all violence and leave the damn mail trains alone. Courts have spoken. They think the strike is over. No, it can't be. Not after all we've accomplished. If we don't get the trains moving, they'll use force. President Cleveland would never. He's a friend to labor. You hear that? Troops are massing down on Jackson Street. Call off the strike at once, or they'll arrest us. Debs goes to the window to see the troops for himself. He sits in silence, mulling over his options. Then he settles on it. No, we will stand our ground. Are you suggesting we defy the law? I am proclaiming it. The only crime the American Railway Union is guilty of is showing sympathy to the Pullman employees. If we are arrested for that, then our nation has lost its very soul. Tell our people to keep the peace, but hold their ground. President Grover Cleveland always considered himself on the side of labor. On June 28, 1894, two days into the American Railway Union strike, he made Labor Day an official federal holiday. He had been swept into office by a coalition of Democrats, members of the New Populist Party, and labor supporters. Past events like the Homestead Strike and Coal Creek War had further solidified Cleveland's base of support in the pro-labor movement. These violent clashes pitted American workers against their employers, the wealthy magnates and industrialists pejoratively known as robber barons. One of these robber barons was George Pullman, founder of the Pullman Car Company. Pullman had a near monopoly on the manufacture of rail cars. His mistreatment of his labor force in the company town of Pullman, Chicago, drew his company into the sights of labor activists. American Railway Union President Eugene Debs called the struggle with the Pullman Company a contest between the producing classes and the money power of the country. But when the Pullman strike began in the summer of 1894, President Cleveland did not come to the defense of labor. He tried his best to stay out of it. To Cleveland, the role of government was to act as an arbitrator, a neutral third party that settled disputes but didn't pick sides. But the Pullman strike was getting wildly out of hand. It was the first ever national strike with all rail lines west of Chicago at a standstill. President Cleveland's attorney general, Richard Olney, despised strikes. In his opinion, they were no different than insurgencies. But for Olney, the Pullman strike, which he called Deb's Rebellion, was also personal. Olney had been the director of several railroads, and he knew the industry well. He pressured President Cleveland to act immediately to prevent the spread of lawlessness, saying, if the rights of the United States were vigorously asserted in Chicago, the origin of the demonstration, the result would be to make it a failure everywhere else and to prevent its spread over the entire country. For Olney, there was only one way to stamp out Deb's rebellion by force. But Cleveland was not willing to get involved, so only hatched a plan. He claimed the strike had disrupted the U.S. Postal Service, making it a federal issue. Only suggested that if the courts ruled the strike illegal, it would put pressure on Debs to end it. The president, in the meantime, would be kept clean of the whole affair. Though ARU's president, Eugene Debs, denied Olney's assertion, Olney's strategy worked on President Cleveland. And though he didn't know it, by going along with Olney's plan— Cleveland had set himself on a collision course with the American Rail Union and his Democratic Party. Attorney General Olney won an injunction from the courts against the Pullman boycott, but Eugene Debs ignored the injunction and continued the strike. When small incidents of violence began breaking out, Olney used the unrest as a pretext to act. He cited a Civil War statute intended for times of war, which empowered the government to protect against domestic violence. Only used this obscure law, the mail stoppage, and Deb's defiance of the court order as fodder to press Cleveland to take executive action. The president finally agreed to end the boycott by using force. Cleveland sent 6,000 troops to Chicago, along with an army of deputies, to make arrests, saying, If it takes the Army and Navy of the United States to deliver a postcard in Chicago, that card will be delivered. But Debs warned of the tenuous nature of the situation, telling a reporter, the first shots fired by the regular soldiers at the mob here will be the signal for a civil war. Bloodshed will follow, and 90% of the people of the United States will be arrayed against the other 10%, and 
and I would not care to be arrayed against the laboring people in the contest. Deb's prediction came true at least in part. On the evening of July 5, 1894, the strike turned into a riot. The presence of federal troops incited a few groups of strikers to overturn and set fire to rail cars. The next morning, a United States deputy fired into a crowd of strikers, killing an innocent unarmed man. From there, the simmering violence boiled over. More fires were started. The Chicago rail yards went up in flames. Ultimately, federal troops led a bayonet charge against civilians. Though estimates vary, somewhere between 12 and 30 were killed. After the smoke cleared, ARU President Eugene Debs was arrested. He would serve six months in prison, only to emerge with even more radical views. He would continue the fight for labor, but not as head of the American Railway Union. Instead, as a presidential candidate for the Socialist Party of America. When Cleveland repealed the Sherman Silver Act, many Democrats had felt betrayed. When he used federal force against the Pullman boycott, he irrevocably damaged his credibility with his base. In the winter midterms of 1894, Cleveland's decisions cost him severely. Many disaffected Democrats stayed away from the polls. Many others cast their votes for a third party, which had already made gains in the 1892 election, the People's Party, also known as the Populist Party. Primarily a party of farmers and laborers, the far-left platform of the People's Party was critical of big business, pro-silver, and called for government ownership of the railroads. It became the perfect home for Democrats angry with President Cleveland. As a result, the 1894 midterm elections were the biggest political swing in the nation's history. Cleveland had begun his second term with his fellow Democrats in control of both houses. But in the midterms, Democrats lost over 100 seats in the House and four seats in the Senate. 24 states failed to elect a single Democrat, with another six electing only one each. This embarrassing law ceded complete control of Congress to Republicans, making it the first midterm in history that a president's party lost both houses. But in the wake of this political bloodbath, Grover Cleveland would not do himself any favors. His subsequent actions would further alienate his party, cost him the Democratic nomination, and set the stage for the Republicans to seize power. Wicked Game is sponsored by NetSuite. 2024 is going to be a watershed year for my business. We've hired up, made ambitious plans, and that means, yes, new podcasts. But also, we crossed a point of complexity that's made it more important than ever to know our numbers. Because if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, all into one platform and one source of truth. And with NetSuite, you'll reduce IT costs because NetSuite lives in the cloud with no hardware required, accessible from anywhere. You'll cut the cost of maintaining multiple systems because you've got one unified business management suite and you improve efficiency by bringing all your major business processes into one platform, slashing manual tasks and errors. Over 37,000 companies have already made the move, so do the math and see how you'll profit with NetSuite this year. Now through April 15th, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash elections. That's netsuite.com slash elections. netsuite.com slash elections. At the time, I only felt a punch. I think everything went wrong. His drug of choice was heroin. Binging and purging over and over and over. Evaluate you, and if you're okay to go, they're going to let you go. This is Justin, and I do the Peripheral Podcast. I have a true crime background, but when telling the stories of true crime, sometimes you have to gloss over topics like mental illness, drug addiction, sexual assault. And I feel like we do that in life too. So this podcast is my attempt to bring all of these topics that are on the peripheral into the mainstream. So please join me wherever you listen to podcasts. It's February 4th, 1895, and a man has just arrived in Washington with a big idea. The economic situation across the country is dire. Over the past few months, gold reserves have continued to plummet. This man has an idea to save the economy, and he's come to Washington, D.C. to share it with the president. The man is escorted to the White House, up to the executive residence. As he waits alone, the man takes a cigar from his pocket and rolls it in his fingers. 
It will take one of the most powerful men in the country to fix the gold reserve crisis. That is precisely why J.P. Morgan, the famous banker, has come to Washington. Mr. President, Mr. Morgan, I'm sure you know Attorney General Olney, Treasury Secretary Carlyle. Gentlemen, please be seated. What brings you to Washington, Mr. Morgan? Gold in the Treasury's reserve. President Cleveland knows the reserve is running low. Whatever favor J.P. Morgan is asking for, he is not in a position to help. Well, sir, if you wish to take any gold from the Treasury... No, 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 Mr. President. I wish to put gold in. Well, if you wish to buy some public bonds, we will soon be issuing... No, sir, we do not have the time. The issue has already been decided, Mr. Morgan. The real issue, Mr. President, is that there is an investor in New York with a draft for $10 million in gold. I'm sure we can handle that amount. No, Mr. President. The Treasury only has $9 million. When that $10 million draft is presented, you won't be able to meet it. The United States will be insolvent before the end of the day. The President knew the situation was bad, but hearing the word insolvent drains the color from his face. What do you suggest, Mr. Morgan? We must act quickly, sir. I suggest a private sale of American bonds. I will lead a syndicate of investors who will pay for the bonds in gold. That's no good, Mr. Morgan. Congress will never allow a private sale. Mr. President, back in the Civil War, when I was in a mining village trading gold, I stopped at a saloon to play a game of solitaire. There I heard tell of a statute that gave President Lincoln the authority to do exactly what I'm suggesting. This is news to Cleveland's ears. Even his attorney general, Richard Olney, is unaware of the law. Olney quickly stands and fetches a book of revised statutes. He flips through the pages and stares in disbelief. Olney hands the book to Treasury Secretary Carlyle, who reads Section 3700 aloud. The Secretary of the Treasury may purchase coin with any of the bonds or notes of the United States upon such terms as he may deem most advantageous to the public interest. This seems to suffice, Mr. Morgan. How much are you suggesting? One hundred million ought to do it. We'll put that much back into the Treasury in exchange for bonds. The President is apprehensive. Mr. Morgan, is there enough gold left on American shores to accomplish such a venture? My syndicate will secure half of what's needed from abroad. And what guarantee have we that if we adopt this plan, the gold you deposit will not continue to be shipped abroad as it has been prior? Can you guarantee that this will not happen? Morgan raises an eyebrow. With this request, President Cleveland is fundamentally asking Morgan to control the international gold markets during the life of the contract. It's a tall order, but if anyone can do it, it's J.P. Morgan. Yes, Mr. President. Until the contract has been concluded and the goal has been reached, you have my word. Cleveland offers his hand. Morgan takes it, and with a single handshake, the economy is rescued. Nicknamed Jupiter, J.P. Morgan was truly a titan of his day. Even the very news of his deal with Cleveland calmed the market, and Morgan's syndicate held up their end. Morgan and his fellow investors agreed to buy $62.3 million in bonds in exchange for 3.5 million ounces of gold, valued at $17.80 per ounce. But the market price of gold at the time was slightly higher than the contract price, netting the Morgan syndicate a $3 million premium in addition to any interest on the bonds. Through his deal with Morgan, Cleveland bought the American economy a way out of collapse. But for many Democrats, the price was too high. In their minds, Cleveland had sold out their party's values. The Silverite Democrats viewed bankers and Wall Street titans like Morgan as criminals. By striking a backroom deal with them, without congressional approval or oversight, Cleveland had colluded with the enemy. The charges of corruption were so strident that soon congressional committees began to investigate. Congress summoned J.P. Morgan to testify, but he was cagey and evasive. When one senator asked him directly how much he had profited from the deal, Morgan replied, That I decline to answer. I am perfectly ready to state to the committee every detail of the negotiations up to the time that the bonds became my property and were paid for. What I did with my own property subsequent to that purchase, I decline to state, except this, that no member of the government in any department was interested directly or indirectly herewith. But few Democrats were willing to take the word of J.P. Morgan, one of the most despised of the Gilded Age robber barons. Still, regardless of the claims of corruption, the scheme had worked. Morgan's gold stabilized the situation and put an end to the panic. The success of the plan made the Treasury stable, but it left Grover Cleveland politically bankrupt. While most in the populist and Democratic parties were angered at the move, many Republicans were delighted. 
Most Republicans had supported the repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. They'd applauded when Cleveland used force against labor during the Pullman strike. The Morgan deal gave them even more cause for celebration. Cleveland had protected the U.S. dollar, the banks, and the barons who owned them. And so, Cleveland's detractors labeled him a bourbon Democrat, likening him to the bourbon kings of France beheaded at the hands of liberal revolutionaries. To many, it seemed Cleveland now had more in common with Republicans than his own party. On June 16, 1896, the Republican National Convention was held in St. Louis, Missouri. The wealthy industrialist Marcus Hanna served as chairman of the Republican National Committee. Under his command, the Republican Party was a powerful political machine with a well-developed platform. Republicans were largely pro-expansion, calling for the acquisition of Hawaii. They also supported a revolution in Cuba that would wrest the island away from Spain in order to take it for the U.S. Nativists in the party pushed for the ban of all illiterate immigrants. The key planks, however, were high tariffs and the gold standard. United behind these central policies, the Republicans would find their candidate in former governor and congressman William McKinley. Called the Idol of Ohio, William McKinley Jr.'s father had been a second-generation pig iron worker, smelting iron from ore. But McKinley's mother had wanted a better life for her son, so she had him enrolled in a private Methodist seminary. During the Civil War, McKinley had volunteered for service as a commissary sergeant, risking his life delivering meals to soldiers in combat. At the Battle of Antietam, he had driven his wagon through heavy Confederate fire to reach the famished Union soldiers. This act of bravery had caught the eye of then-officer and future president Rutherford B. Hayes. Hayes assigned the young McKinley to be a member of his staff, and throughout the remainder of the war, McKinley had risen through the ranks, eventually becoming brevet major by the age of 22. After the war, McKinley's rise in Ohio politics had been equally meteoric. He had first been elected to Congress in 1876. Realizing the threat he posed to their agenda, Democrats had tried to gerrymander him out of office not once, but twice. Still, McKinley had prevailed, winning multiple re-election campaigns and rising to become the chairman of the powerful Ways and Means Committee in 1889. It was from this post that he lent his name and influence to advocate for the highest tariff ever proposed. The McKinley Tariff Act of 1890, the same act Democrats had blamed for the Panic of 1893. Democrats in Ohio had retaliated by trying to redistrict him again, forcing McKinley into a hard-fought special election to keep his seat. He lost that election by only 300 votes. Dejected, he had returned to Ohio and launched a successful campaign for governor. McKinley was popular, even-handed, but he was sloppy with his personal finances. During the Panic of 1893, he had been hoodwinked into a bad financial deal by an acquaintance. The deal had left him with over $100,000 in debt, $2.8 million in today's dollars. But a group of wealthy supporters had come to his aid and footed the bill. One of these wealthy men was Mark Hanna. A millionaire by 40, Hanna had broad experience and exceptional acumen, having business in coal, steel, railroads, and newspapers. In the 1896 contest, he used this breadth of experience to lead the fight for McKinley's nomination. Hanna and McKinley made a good pair. With McKinley setting the policy agenda and Hanna ferociously running the campaign, just as he'd done with each of his businesses. Hanna was also an effective surrogate, taking countless meetings and shoring up support with politicians and fellow businessmen. He also bankrolled the campaign, paying to print thousands of copies of McKinley's speeches, along with shipping campaign posters, badges, and buttons to every state. Seeing the beginning of his work in Alabama, one senator predicted... If Mr. Hanna has covered every district in the United States in the same manner that he did those in Alabama, McKinley will be nominated. Hanna's efforts paid off. At the June 1896 Republican convention, McKinley won the nomination on the first ballot. To bolster his chances in the general election, the Republicans chose corporate lawyer Garrett Hobart of New Jersey as his running mate. Party leaders hoped to get the neighboring state of New York, a pivotal swing state, to vote Republican. But there was another reason. With the party fully committed to the gold standard, a political moderate like Hobart might also placate any Silverite Republicans who weren't enthused by McKinley sitting at the top of the ticket. Republicans called McKinley the advance agent of prosperity, the only candidate capable of saving the stalled economy and reversing the trend of rampant unemployment. With the nomination in their pocket and the party united behind the McKinley-Hobart ticket, Hannah and McKinley went to work. Meanwhile, Democrats were not nearly as unified. The party was split over issues of gold and silver, the role of the federal government, and how to move past the economic crisis. But one plank in the Democratic platform was not up for debate. It read, 
we are opposed to the issuing of interest-bearing bonds and condemn the trafficking with banking syndicates. President Cleveland's deal with J.P. Morgan might have saved the economy, but it cost him the nomination. Cleveland was out. At the Democratic Convention in the summer of 1896, a little-known Nebraskan politician would use that occasion in his gift of words to seize his party's nomination and change the face of the 1896 contest. Ah, Asia, the land of contrast. So mysterious, so diverse, so peaceful, so safe. But seriously, is that how it really is? While Asia is 100% filled with amazing people, culture, food, and landscape, it is also home to crazy legends, superstitions, and of course, atrocious crimes. The Asian Madness podcast covers a wide variety of topics, ranging from silly weird things to unimaginable horrors. Why is a murder case nicknamed the Hello Kitty murder? Why do people avoid picking up random red envelopes on the streets? And who are the most infamous serial killers you've probably never heard of from Asia? If any of that sounds interesting, search for and subscribe to the Asian Madness Podcast on your favorite podcast app. Tired of ads and promos like these? Want to skip ahead to newer elections? You can listen to all episodes of American Elections Wiki Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. But not only that, you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts, also all ad-free. That includes the American Revolution podcast, a deep and thorough investigation of the times, people, and politics behind America's fight for independence. Also, the battles, because we can't start a new American nation without guns. And the American Revolution podcast tells the story of the revolution from beginning to end, from its origins in the French and Indian War, through the war itself, and on to the founding of the United States. Get American Elections Wicked Game, the American Revolutions podcast, and many others ad-free with bonus content at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. It's July 9th, 1896, inside the Chicago Coliseum, and the Democratic Party is at war with itself. The economic crisis has caused a tectonic shift in the political landscape, and a fault line has split the party in two. Bourbon Democrats of the Northeast largely represent big business and the gold standard. Silverites of the South and West largely represent farmers and laborers. One by one, men jockeying to be the next Democratic presidential nominee take to the podium. By settling the debate over the standard, they hope to solve the debate over who will be the nominee. Up first is an avid white supremacist, Congressman Benjamin Tillman of South Carolina. When this convention disperses, I hope my fellow citizens will have a different opinion of the man with the pitchfork from South Carolina. Tillman once called Grover Cleveland a bag of beef, and he threatened to prod the president with a pitchfork, lending him the nickname Pitchfork Ben. I am from South Carolina, which was the home of secession. Oh, hiss if you like. There are only three things on earth which can hiss. A goose, a serpent, and a man with no knowledge whatsoever of South Carolina's grand history. South Carolina demands the emancipation of the white slaves. A silverite, Tillman likens the gold standard to slavery for the poor farmer. Though the crowd mostly agrees with him on silver, they have grown tired of Tillman's abrasive tirades and Civil War references. Another speaker takes the podium. It's bourbon Democrat Senator Hill of New York. I am a Democrat, but I am not a revolutionist. My mission here today is to unite, not to divide. I therefore start out with this proposition, that the Democratic Party stands in favor neither of a silver standard nor of a gold standard. We should not attempt the experiment of the free and unlimited coinage of silver without cooperation of other great nations. Hill's lack of support for silver proves to be his undoing. Though many other Democrats from the Northeast agree with him, they are in the minority. The majority of the crowd are silverites and make their support of silver known. Just then, a freshman congressman from Nebraska takes to the podium. His name is William Jennings Bryan. The humblest citizen in all the land, when clad in the armor of a righteous cause, is stronger than all the hosts of error. I come to speak to you in defense of a cause as holy as the cause of liberty, the cause of humanity. William Jennings Bryan is only 36, yet he's already found his way onto the coveted Ways and Means Committee. There, he's proven himself a powerful order, and he's used his gift to push for a very popular issue, 
silver. There are two ideas of government. There are those who believe that if you will only legislate to make the well-to-do prosperous, their prosperity will leak through to those below. The democratic idea, however, has been that if you legislate to make the masses prosperous, their prosperity will find its way up through every class which rests upon them. If Republicans dare to come out in the open field and defend the gold standard as a good thing, we will fight them to the uttermost. Having behind us the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, the toilers everywhere, we will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Brian's speech is considered one of the most famous in American political history. That day in the convention hall in Chicago, it worked. The New York Times wrote, Brian's bearing is graceful, his face handsome, his utterance is clear and strong, his style is free, bold, picturesque, and brilliant. No wonder that his oration moved the emotional and enthusiastic Silverites, and at once turned the delegates to the boy orator of the Platte. But Brian's victory was not yet assured. When balloting commenced, Missouri Congressman Richard P. Bland, a revered Democrat, older statesman, and strong Silverite, was viewed as the presumptive nominee. On the first ballot, Bland took 235 votes, nearly 100 more than Bryan, but not enough for a majority. On the second ballot, as lesser candidates dropped out, Bryan gained votes for a total of 197, but so too did Bland with 281. The New York Times described the horse race that followed in the breathless tone of a track reporter. The third ballot began suspiciously for Bland, but it soon turned Bryan's way. Bland's gains were 10, but Bryan increased his vote 22. When the fourth ballot began with the shifting of Alabama's 22 votes from Bland to Bryan and California, Idaho, and Kansas gave their votes to Bryan, the end was in sight. The Illinois delegates left the hall while the votes were being completed. Everybody knew what that meant. The announcement of the fourth ballot, with Bryan leading with 280 votes and Bland next with 240, was a signal for a rumpus. It was stopped with difficulty, and after much delay, the fifth and final ballot was begun. As the roll call proceeded for the fifth ballot, an exciting scene developed. Alabama, California, Colorado, Georgia, Idaho, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Michigan, Mississippi, Nebraska, North Carolina, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Virginia, and most of the territories enrolled their votes for Bryan. But when the fifth call was completed, he still needed votes. To recruit the line, the Bryan men organized a march about the Nebraska delegates. And under the inspiration or infection of excitement, presently were able to collect near a majority of two-thirds. Illinois came back into the hall to swell the list with her 48 votes, but Illinois did not nominate him. It was not until Governor Stone, speaking for Missouri, cast 34 votes for Bryan that the gifted Blatherskite was selected as the presidential candidate of the Democratic Populist Convention. But not all Democrats were happy with Bryan's speech. Once the Democratic Convention had chosen silver as their platform, gold Democrats went into open revolt. They attempted a coup and approached President Cleveland to run as a third-party candidate. But Cleveland was finished with politics, and he refused to go for a third term. Instead, he chose retirement. And as a final betrayal to Democrats, Grover Cleveland endorsed the Republican candidate, calling McKinley a sound money man. But there were three parties in this race. The Democrats' embrace of silver as a key plank in its platform left the People's Party with a difficult decision. The People's Party was made up of silverite farmers and laborers. If they ran a candidate of their own, they would split the silver vote with Democrats, all but guaranteeing McKinley's victory. So at their conference in St. Louis, they chose to throw their support behind the Democratic candidate, William Jennings Bryan, making the three-way race a head-to-head -head competition. The election of 1896 is often called the Battle of the Standards. Economic policies were the hot issues, and the Republicans and Democrats offered sharply differing views. Republican William McKinley campaigned on protectionist tariffs and the gold standard, planks one and two of the Republican platform. Democrat William Jennings Bryan argued the opposite, low tariffs and the free and unlimited coinage of silver and gold. But both these platforms carried political and economic risk. The Panic of 1893 was largely blamed on two factors, the McKinley Tariff and the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. Yet McKinley wanted to pass another high tariff, and Bryan wanted to again establish a silver standard. In order to win, both candidates would have to convince the public to give their policy another shot. 
The two candidates also ran their campaigns very differently. Brian was a gifted orator and traveled across the country speaking directly to voters. He ran a grassroots campaign going town to town, crossing more than 18,000 miles and giving 20 speeches a day, 600 in all. The McKinley campaign, led by millionaire Marcus Hanna, operated less from the stump and more in boardrooms. McKinley stayed put, conducting a front porch campaign where he spoke to small groups who visited him at his home. Meanwhile, Hannah courted big business. As a result, an enormous amount of money flowed through their campaign. While Brian had a $650,000 war chest, McKinley amassed a staggering $3.5 million, with some estimates as high as $16 million, equal to half a billion dollars today. This money changed the campaign and the future of American politics. At the time, the country had 15 million prospective voters. Throughout the campaign, Hannah littered them with over 250 million pamphlets, 17 marketing pieces for every voter in America. He also freely distributed gold bug lapel pins and tie tacks and printed up fake dollar bills with Brian's face on them that read, In God We Trust for the Other 53 Cents, insinuating that under a silver system, the dollar would lose more than half its value. Hannah also weaponized the press. In September of 1896, a report was issued by the New York Times from an anonymous psychiatrist whose analysis described Democrat Brian as possessing a relentless and mental vagabondage, an intense overmastering and growing egotism, and grandiose ideas that are almost, if not quite, delusional. The doctor then blamed this confused and illogical mental state on what was called Brian's bad hereditary history. McKinley's allies in business made their opinions known, too, including voting advice in notes attached to employees' payslips. The business owner's message was clear. The survival of their companies, and therefore their employees' jobs, depended on a McKinley presidency. Meanwhile, Brian continued stumping, speaking himself hoarse, trying to convince the millions that came to see him that low tariffs and silver were the way forward. But Brian was just one man. Hannah's Republican machine hired scores of gifted orders to campaign for McKinley, including New York City Police Commissioner Theodore Roosevelt. So when the election was held in November of 1896, the result was clear. Money talked louder than William Jennings Bryan ever could. Bryan did well in the South and West, but his victories there could not overcome McKinley's lead in the numerous and densely populated eastern states. McKinley defeated Bryan with 271 electoral votes and 51% of the popular vote. But state by state, the popular vote was not nearly so close. McKinley had an overwhelming lead in every New England state, New York, Pennsylvania, and Illinois. Bryan won commanding majorities in the South and Mountain West. Sectionalism in 1896 America was as alive as it ever had been, as different areas in the country saw different solutions to their social and economic problems. But McKinley's first term in office would not be defined by his economic policy. It would be defined by his foreign policy. With a splendid little war, McKinley would extend Manifest Destiny past the coast and into the sea. He would seek to transform America from a country into an empire. This is episode 28 of American Elections Wicked Game, 1896, The Battle of the Standard Bearers. On the next episode, the election of 1900, war with Spain and a campaign of aggression in the Philippines is the backdrop for a rematch of the 1896 contest, but the election instead gives rise to a new political hero and brings about the fall of another. Did you know you can skip ads and promos like these and listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com? And not only will you be getting the whole series ad-free and bingeable, but you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts also ad-free, like Her Half of History. Because even though Hillary Clinton may not have made history when she ran for president in 2016, there have always been women who seized power, spied for their country, created artistic masterpieces, even escaped slavery. Her Half of History is perfect for all those who sat in history class and wondered, what were the women doing all this time? Because the answer is a lot. Get Her Half of History, Wicked Game, and many others ad-free at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Elections Wicked Game is an airship production. Hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Sound designed by Derek Behrens. Music by Lindsey Graham. Co-executive produced by Stephen Walters in association with Ritual Productions. Written and researched by Eric Archilla and Lindsey Graham. 
Fact-checking by Greg Jackson and Ciel Salazar from the podcast History That Doesn't Suck. We all love pop culture, but you know what? It can be exhausting. And you know what there isn't enough of is actually funny working comedians talking about all the stuff that we love. And to be honest, love to hate. From what's trending online with celebrities to what's trending online, well... Because TikTok told us so. Hi, guys. I'm comedian Justin Martindale, the host of the Just Sayin' podcast with Justin Martindale on the Comedy Store Network, the mecca of comedy. And each week, I sit down with some of the funniest people you know, and we talk about all of the things happening right now in pop culture. And we have the best guests from Leslie Jones to Katya to Zainab Johnson and Pete Holmes. We have them all. We break down the hottest stories, the drama, and are unafraid doing so and say what everybody else is thinking. Just Saying with Justin Marndale, coming to you live on the Sunset Strip from the Comedy Store in West Hollywood. So check us out on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you there. You won't be disappointed. Just saying.